Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming to our cooking workshop today. Um, the topic and main theme for our workshop is going to be cooking with plant proteins. Um, so our organizers have prepared and put together some delicious and simple recipes that we hope that you can implement in your own day-to-day -day cooking life. So just uh, to begin, I want to give you an outline of the cooking class that we're going to have today. So the first thing we're going to have is a presentation on the nutritional aspects of plant proteins given by Caitlin. Then we're going to have two cooking demonstrations. One will be on black bean burgers and the other one will be on a vegetarian chili. So after that, we're going to have a hands-on workshop where you will learn how to prepare a delicious quinoa salad. Um, each of you will be assigned to one of the tables around the room and further instructions will be given closer to when we're going to begin the workshop. So um, then after that, we're all going to have the opportunity to sample some of the delicious dishes that we made and take home the recipe. So as mentioned, we will begin our workshop today with a nutrition presentation and I would like to invite Caitlin forward to talk to us about plant proteins. Caitlin is a dietetic intern studying nutrition at the University of Guelph. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Good afternoon. Yeah. It's a pleasure to see each and every one of you here this afternoon. And as Jacob mentioned, I'm going to discuss plant proteins and some of their nutritional benefits today. Uh, but before I get into our discussion, I just want to ask you guys, and I want to try to make this as interactive as possible, what comes to mind when you think of plant proteins or even proteins in general? Beans? Meat. Meat or protein? Sorry, but that's what it is. Basic energy. Basic energy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Muscles. Muscles, yeah. So these are all things that we're going to be discussing, and I especially want to delve into some of the common misconceptions when it comes to proteins and the sources that we can get for our bodies. So today we're going to be talking about what proteins are, some of the functions of proteins in our bodies, so muscles was mentioned as one of the functions, but I'm sure you'll be surprised to see just how many things proteins do in our bodies. Um, we're also going to talk about some common misconceptions about plant proteins specifically, and how to get the most out of our plant protein sources. So let's start with the basics. What are proteins? Well, the word protein is derived from the Greek word protos, which means of prime importance. So this is telling us that they're very important for our bodies. And protein is actually the second most abundant component in our bodies after water. So they play a significant role in a lot of our functions. Proteins themselves are actually made up of smaller building blocks called amino acids. And if you can see the picture in the bottom, I guess for you guys left, bottom left corner, that is the base of an amino acid. And so all of the amino acids have this base in common, and each of the other amino acids will have a different tail. So if you can see that picture in the top corner, there are 20 amino acids, and they vary by that tail structure. And so because they all have this different structure, they'll have different functions in our bodies. And what our bodies can do is they can take these amino acids and combine them in so many different forms to do all of our bodily processes. Um, and so in our bodies, we have 20 amino acids in total, and nine are considered essential amino acids. How many of you have heard that term before? Essential amino acids. Does anyone know what an essential amino acid is, or can you take a guess? Any ideas? Something required to break down something in your body, I guess? Yeah, so an essential amino acid is the type that our bodies can't synthesize, so we have to get them from our food. 
Um, so these are the ones that we focus on when we talk about the foods that we're getting because these nine cannot be made by our bodies and we still need them for our function so we have to get them from our food. And this bottom picture here is kind of just to help you appreciate the complexity of these protein structures. So those little beads that you can see in the top there are the individual amino acids which come together to form what's known as a polypeptide chain. And these chains kind of wrap around themselves and make more and more complex structures till they become that really complex protein in there. So when we're talking proteins, it's a lot more than just muscles. It does so much for our bodies. So these are some common proteins that we can recognize in our bodies. Maybe some of these things that you've heard of. Um, antibodies, for example, are playing a role in our immune system. Insulin is a hormone that helps with the regulation of blood sugar, um, and all of these play different roles in our bodies. So, functions of proteins in our bodies. Proteins have eight primary functions in our bodies. First of all, they help with growth, structure, and movement. So, for example, our hair and our nails are made out of a protein called keratin, which is constantly growing and regenerating. And, of course, our muscles help with movement and keeping us stable. Um, hormones are also made out of proteins. So hormones are kind of like our body's chemical messengers. They can send signals between organs, between cells, and make sure that our body is communicating with itself. Proteins are also functioning as enzymes. So enzymes are a component in our body which help with metabolic processes and help to break down more complex structures and to aid with digestion. Uh, proteins also help with immune function. So for example, those antibodies that we saw on the last slide um, are made up of proteins and all of the other components are of our immune system as well. Proteins also help with fluid balance. So there's a protein in our bloodstream called albumin and it helps to draw water into our blood. So when our blood sugar, sorry, our blood pressure is low, that albumin can draw more water into our vascular system and help to increase our blood pressure. When our blood pressure is high, that albumin on the outside can draw the water out of our blood system and lower our blood pressure. These are just some other functions. So they can help with acid and base balance. Um, they can help to transport nutrients in our body, so vitamins and minerals. And then they can also, of course, provide us with energy. So proteins can be converted into our body's preferred source of energy, which is glucose, and then used for different functions to fuel the body. So now I want to spend a little bit of time addressing some common misconceptions when it comes to plant-based proteins specifically. And we're going to do a small interactive activity called myth or fact. So I'm going to put a statement on the screen and you guys can tell me if you think that this is a myth or a fact. So the first one, animal proteins are better for gaining muscle mass. Myth. Myth? myth? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you guys got it. So according to the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, Plant and animal proteins actually benefit muscle mass equally. Um, so this means that obviously if you're getting your protein from an animal source or a plant source, um, it has the equal um, use in our body. So if you think about it, when we're eating proteins, they first need to get broken down into those individual amino acids in order to be used by the body. So it really doesn't matter if it's coming from an animal source or a plant source the body still has to go through the same process in order to use it. And in addition to this, plant proteins also contain antioxidants, which help with the uh, inflammation, and so it helps with faster recovery of muscles, whereas animal proteins, while they still help our bodies, what happens is often they're in really large quantities, they're very concentrated, so for this reason, uh, we can end up eating too much protein, and that actually hasn't been shown to cause any benefits for our bodies, and instead it can damage kidneys, um, it can reduce our pH and make the body very acidic. And there is a quote here from a book called The Ministry of Healing, which says that it is a mistake to suppose that muscular strength depends on the use of animal foods. 
the needs of the system can be better supplied and more vigorous health can be enjoyed without its use. The grains with fruits, nuts, and vegetables contain all the nutritive properties necessary to make good blood. So it's very clear here, again, emphasizing that we don't necessarily need those animal proteins in order to get the protein that our body needs. Second one, myth or fact. Animal foods contain a higher quality of protein than plant sources. Myth. Myth? Yeah, so this is also a myth. So the idea that animal foods contain a higher quality protein comes from the understanding of complete versus incomplete proteins. How many of you have heard that term before? Does anyone know what a complete protein is? Or an incomplete protein? It's like something along the lines of like it touches all these categories versus incomplete, it's like only a handful, that's it? Right, exactly. So a complete protein contains all of those nine essential amino acids that we were talking about, whereas an incomplete protein will only contain some. So they'll have different quantities of each type of amino acid. And so in animal sources, it makes sense that it would have all of the amino acids because the animal has eaten the food and its body has already made these proteins. So it's already all together. Whereas with plant sources, some will have some amino acids, others will have others. And our body kind of knows what to do with those things to make the proteins that we need. And I just want to read this quote here again from the Ministry of Healing, which says, Those who eat flesh are but eating grains and vegetables at second hand. For the animal receives from these things the nutrition that produces growth. The life that was in the grains and vegetables passes into the eater. We receive it by eating the flesh of the animal. How much better to get it directly by eating the food that God provided for our use. So basically what this statement is saying here is that when we eat animal foods, we're basically just getting second-hand nutrition, whereas when we're getting it from the plant, we're getting it straight from the source. Okay. Now, how can we get all of these essential amino acids from plant foods? So we talked about how some amino acids are in some plants, whereas others are in others. So how can we make sure that we're getting all of them in the right combination? Um, well, there's this concept called complementary proteins. Has anyone heard that term before? Complementary proteins, right. So this idea is that pairing multiple plant foods will help you to get basically all the amino acids in one meal. Um, so if you can see this chart here, I don't know why it's so blurry, but what I wanted to highlight here was that different foods will have different ratios of these amino acids. So for example, beans are very low in an amino acid called methionine, but when they're paired with things like grains, nuts, and seeds, those foods have the methionine, so you can eat them together. Um, another example are grains, which are low in lysine and threonine, which are other two types of amino acids. So when we eat those things with legumes, we get all nine of those amino acids as well. And these pictures here kind of just illustrate some of the ways that we can combine foods in order to get all of those amino acids. Um, so we have rice and beans. That one's pretty obvious. Uh, what do you guys think would give the complementary proteins in hummus? Any ideas? Well, the, the bean. The, the chickpeas is yeah. one. So what, would the, what else is in hummus? Garlic, okay. The sesame, seed. the sesame seed. Right, so the tahini is made out of sesame seeds, which is a seed. So in combination with the chickpeas, we're getting a com complete source of protein. And what about the peanut butter sandwich? Yeah, yeah the peanut butter gets complemented with? That's a good combination here, right? It's a whole wheat uh, bread. The bread, right. right. So the bread is a whole grain that's giving us some amino acids, and the peanut butter is giving us the other. So again, it's together. But I just want to highlight here that it's not necessary to eat complementary proteins at every single meal, but the idea is that by getting a varied diet throughout the day that includes legumes, nuts, seeds, and whole grains, you're basically getting all of those essential amino acids that your body needs throughout the day. Okay.
Thank you all for your patience. We're back online. Um, so I just wanted to do a little comparison side by side so we can look at the nutritional value of two different foods. So the first one we have here is one cup of cooked lentils and the second is a lean sirloin steak. So which, um, when looking at these two foods side by side, the lentils have 230 calories while the steak has 315. So side by side, pretty good amount of energy in both. Um, looking at the protein content, the lentils only have 18 grams while the steak has 47. So looking at this thing, if we were just to look at the protein isolation, the steak is a much higher quality source of protein. But we'll see why that doesn't mean everything in just a second. So fat content, which food has more fat in it? Steak. The steak. Which food has more cholesterol in it? Mistake. How much cholesterol does it have in it? A lot. Yeah, a lot of cholesterol. And so this is because animals synthesize cholesterol in their bodies, whereas plants don't have any cholesterol in them naturally. So we only get cholesterol from these animal sources, and our body makes it as well. Which food has more carbohydrates? Lentils. The lentils, yeah. And carbohydrates are, I know they get a bad rap, but they are our body's preferred source of energy. And there's different types of carbohydrates. And one of those are fiber, which has a lot of important roles in our body. You can only get dietary fiber from plant sources. It doesn't come from animals. And so fiber helps to manage our cholesterol levels. It helps with our digestion. And it also helps to stabilize our blood sugar. So there's a lot of good benefits you're missing out on there with getting the steak. And again, looking at the percent of energy from fat, the cooked lentils only have 4%, while the steak has 34% of your daily needs. And while we do need some dietary fat, we have to be mindful of how much we're getting. Um, so looking at these two side by side, the lentils provide us with about a third of our body's needs um, of protein for the day, whereas the sirloin steak provides about 74% of our daily protein needs. So I just want to ask you, if you're sitting down with one meal, does it make more sense to eat a third of your protein need or three quarters of your protein needs for that entire day? For one meal, I'm sure the, the third. Right, the third. So we can see here that according to our body's physiological needs, yes, the steak has a lot more protein in it, but realistically, our body doesn't need that much protein in one sitting. And when we eat a lot of animal foods, we end up eating much more protein than our body needs. And you're also missing out on all these beneficial components, such as the carbohydrates and the fiber that we get only from the lentils. So what I want to illustrate with this example is essentially that when we're looking at the foods that we're eating, we have to look at the whole picture. So a lot of times when we're you know, focusing on protein intake, it's really easy to kind of just look side by side, oh, this one has more protein, I'm gonna pick this option. But you really have to break it down and look at what that food is doing for your body as a whole. Oh as a whole, you mean like percentage-wise, you don't need to get all your percentage of your, your yes. body, the body's essential. Yes. And you also have to look at everything else it's providing. So is it providing you with vitamins and minerals, or is it providing you with extra saturated fat that your body does? And then we spread it out through <coughs> meals per day. Exactly. Um, okay. Alright, next slide. So this is just to give you a visual of some sources of plant proteins in our diets. Um, and I will provide you with a handout as well that has all of these as well. Um, and I've also kind of outlined exactly how much protein we can get from each serving of the foods, just to make it a little bit more practical. But as you can see, there's a variety of foods on here that provide us with protein. Are there any that jump out at you that you maybe were surprised about that have protein? Yeah, kale. Kale? kale? Have protein yeah. Kale. yeah. Anything oh, else? Broccoli. broccoli? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Everything that we eat has amino acids in it in some sort of quantity. It's just that some have less and some have more. But these are just some sources from plants that I found to have the highest amount, just to kind of give you a little visual. Do you want 
Hemp seeds. What kind of hemp is that? Mm -hmm. hemp so seeds. this is hulled hemp seeds. Oh, like hold. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, how much protein do we need in a day in order to meet our needs? So, according to Canadian dietary guidelines, an adult needs about 0 0.8 grams of protein per day. So that means that for every kilogram that you weigh, you need about 0 0.8 grams of protein. Um, and then for children, of course, this ratio is a little bit higher because they're still growing. Um, but overall, this kind of shows that your body's protein needs varies depending on your own personal needs. So just to kind of highlight this and put it into practice, um, here are some examples of the protein needs of an individual from just plant sources for one day. Um, so this is illustrated for a 70 kilogram individual. In order to do that calculation, you just multiply the 70 kilograms by the 0 0.8 uh, grams, and that will give you 56 grams of protein for the day. So this is just some examples. Um, of course, this isn't like a full meal. These are just the protein sources, so you would, of course, have you know fruits and vegetables with this as well. But this could look like half a cup of oats, um, two tablespoons of peanut butter, and two tablespoons of hemp seeds with your breakfast, a cup of lentils and a cup of quinoa for your lunch, and a cup of steamed broccoli and a quarter cup of tofu with your dinner. And the second day is another example, half a cup of tofu for breakfast, maybe a scrambled tofu with a tablespoon of nutritional yeast. Um, for lunch, a cup of black beans and a cup of brown rice. And then for dinner, about a cup of kale, half a cup of quinoa, and half a cup of kidney beans. So as you can see, it's definitely very doable to incorporate enough plant proteins in our diet, as long as we are, again, getting a variety of different foods. Okay, so just some key takeaways from what we discussed this morning. I want you to remember that when choosing proteins, it's really important to look at the nutritional value of the food as a whole and not just different nutrients in isolation. So remember with that example of the lentils and the sirloin steak, we want to look at the whole picture when selecting our foods. And then additionally, by eating a variety of plant foods each day, incorporating lentils, beans, whole grains, nuts, and seeds, will ensure that we're getting our body's protein needs from plant sources. So that brings me to the end of my presentation for this morning, and I just wanted to open it up to any questions if anyone has at this time. Can you explain a little bit more on um, nutritional yeast? Yeah. Yeah, can you explain a little bit more Which on part that? specifically? Um, I see that right there is a mm -hmm. nutritional yeast, yes. right? So, can, I mean, I'm hearing about it, and I'm, some people say it's good, and then you're hearing a lot of parts saying it's not too good. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to, if you can explain a little bit more on that. Yeah, so from what yeah. I'm understanding, nutritional yeast is beneficial. Yeah. So it's a type of yeast, basically, is made by bacteria. Uh -huh. um, and nutritional yeast contains protein, and it also contains a lot of vitamin B12. So for vegetarians, it's a really good source of vitamin B12. Um, and I think one serving, one tablespoon, will give you 400% of your daily value. Okay, so how, how do you use that? Um, so nutritional yeast can be used as a seasoning on food, kind of substituted for Parmesan or anything like that. You can put it in salads. Uh, you can put it on popcorn. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And um, the nutritional value of intake and individual should take if you have a high metabolism, does that differ from somebody that has a low metabolism? Yes, so someone who's doing more activity will have higher protein needs. Um, I didn't break down exactly specifically for each individual how much they need. It will really depend, but this is kind of the average set out by um, the Canadian guidelines. And so obviously if you need more, you'll have a bit more. If you need less, you'll have a bit less. Um, the nutritional value intake uh, per day, is this just the average just to get you by? Or is there um, nutritional value um, higher when like, um, you want to gain weight or lose weight? So I would say that when it comes to nutritional value, you have to look at all your macros. Um, so proteins will provide you with benefits, but if you're over consuming with proteins, 
studies have shown that there is actually no benefit to your body and your body actually has to break down that waste and those waste products are actually very toxic on your body and can damage your kidneys over time. So if a person is looking to gain weight, I would say to look to other nutrients as well and not just the protein, but you will be eating more overall, if that makes sense. Clarification, you mean by weight, like you mean like in general, or you mean like muscle mass? Like what do you mean by like, can you clarify that? Like, I'm trying to build muscle I was talking about weight in general. In general? Yeah. 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 So okay, for muscle mass, and which is, you said the scale is that like, your weight versus how much you intake daily. So mm -hmm. if you're working out, shouldn't that be higher, I guess, depending? Yes, you should be having a bit more protein, um, but not. I think that the mainstream promotes too much protein when it comes to the amount that they're looking for bodybuilders and stuff like that. Um, so you just have to be mindful. I would say like even with that 0 0.8, you're getting an adequate amount of protein. I would be more worried about getting too much. Yes. I think the, 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 the build of mass, uh, the theory is that you make, you make fat and fat is converted into muscle. Is that how it goes? Uh, it's a muscle fibers that tear and then replace muscle fibers that tears again. And you have to give time to heal. But the protein is equal point. Everything is equal point. Yeah. 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 Ye
And then I'll put that into my mixing bowl over here. And uh, I'll put on gloves for this. Um, if you're at home, you don't have to use gloves because it's just you and your family. Um, but I'll do that for right now. And this is the most, honestly, the most um, difficult and tedious part of the recipe. Everything else is very, very simple. So I found that, uh, um, that mashing the beans with a fork works the best. Um, I tried a potato masher and I found that uh, the fork works best. So it is tedious and it will take a while, but um, oh, to turn the stove on. <laughs> so you'll just mash up all the beans while your mushrooms are cooking. So if you mash them up, it's going to be easier to cook, faster to cook? Um, I'm going to be making burgers from these, so if I didn't mash them up, oh, okay. um, they wouldn't be burgers, they would be a bunch yes. of beans baked <laughs> in the middle of the cookie sheet. Um, um, yeah. if, if you mash them up, can you mash them up with the black beans and cook it? Should you like to? Or? I haven't tried that, but I don't... I'm sure you can. Like you could cook your own beans, and uh, it it'll work just fine. I'm just gonna keep an eye on the mushrooms. Can I just ask something? Yeah. I'm sorry. I was uh, very maybe somebody asked for the question, but instead of uh, doing bread with a fork, right, or masher, whatever, can you do it in a food processor? Um, I don't have a food processor at home. Um, the recipe that I found said you can use a food processor. I don't have any personal experience with that, but by all means you can try that. I did try my magic bullet and the fork works a lot better. <laughs> so this is the best way that I have found to do this. <laughs> yeah. So I guess you don't want it too brown, you know what I mean? Too, and then it becomes like a puree. So you have to use a processor maybe. Yeah, I found that like when I used the magic bullet, the bottom was um, very pureed, but yeah. the rest like it wouldn't mix. So I just found it easier. And like, even if you mash it a lot, it will still kind of, like you'll still be able to see like the skins, and that's fine. It'll still hold together in the oven. These aren't cooking very fast down here, that's okay. I'm just going to add a little more water since it seems pretty dry over right here. Um, I'll add all my other ingredients. Um, so I'm going to need, uh, I believe it's uh, three tablespoons of tomato um, paste. Um, I just used uh, crushed tomatoes that you can get in a can from the grocery store. So I just want three tablespoons. That's one, two, and three. And then I have um, different uh, seasonings here. So I have um, two tablespoons. It is two tablespoons, right? I have two tablespoons of flour that will help to um, hold the patties together. And I have um, I have half a teaspoon of salt, 
and half a teaspoon of garlic powder and a quarter of a teaspoon of onion powder here. Okay, now our mushrooms are starting to cook. Um, so I'm just gonna add all those ingredients right now. Let's start to it a little bit. There we go. So right now, all we have to do is wait for our mushrooms to cook, and then we'll um, just be combining all of our ingredients together. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think my, our mushrooms need to be just a little bit more cooked. Mushroom black bean burger, or can you do other um, vegetables? I um, it says you can like I try only mushrooms, but yeah. you can do other vegetables. other vegetables. So any um, any vegetables you want to, you can experiment. Yeah. Um, just cook them, and you will have. Um, I forgot my measuring cup in the kitchen. Sister, yes. can you get me my measuring cup from the kitchen? Measuring cup? Yes, please. Oh, big one. The, the clear one that I have. Measuring okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. I thought I had everything. Okay. Just a little bit. Our uh, mushrooms will be ready. But I think that looks about right. Even a little bit more this would be fine, but I think that's good. Thank you. Um, I don't need the water in here. Okay, so um, this is more than um, enough, but we want half a cup of our um, cooked diced vegetables. In this case, I'm using mushrooms. So I'm just going to Take it, and I'm going to measure half a cup over here. <clears throat> oh, so you need just half a cup? Yes. Your sm the smaller package of mushrooms that you get in the store will be more than enough. Okay. So you can use them for something else if you're cooking something else at the same time. A little bit more. Okay, that's about right. So I will put uh, my mushrooms into my mixture over here. So now you're just gonna take it and mix it all together. I should have brought my other spoon, but that's okay. It looks good already. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so we just want to mix it all together. Thank you. I had just about finished, but um, yeah, that's good. Okay, so now um, you have two options. You can either um, oil your baking sheet or you can um, put a piece of parchment paper on it. I found that when I put a piece of parchment paper instead of um, oiling it, I found that when I, it came time to flip them, um, it was difficult to get the spatula under and actually flip it, but that is an option. 
Um, so then you're going to just take your mixture and form it into burgers. And you can make them whatever size you want, but I'll try to make them about the size that you would want if you wanted to use this as a substitute for a hamburger. Um, so you'll just use your hands to, um, to form them into burgers and place them on your cookie sheet. So I'll just show you a couple. Perhaps I should have done it over there where the camera is. So, um, and then this will go into the oven for um, 10 minutes at 350. So you'll bake it for 10 minutes at 350 and then after that you'll flip it. I just want to show you what happens when you flip it. So I have this one. It's already fully baked, but I'll pretend that it's time to flip it. Um, so when it comes to flipping it, um, I found that like, especially if the, burg if the burgers are small, it's not as big of a problem, but if you try to make them a little bit bigger, um, I found that when you slide the spatula under, um, they kind of squish together. Um, what I found helped a little bit was to um, oil the spatula to make it easier to get under and then to flip it. And you might have to flatten it a little bit um, to get it back into shape once you've flipped it. Um, but as I said, you can experiment with that. So we'll just take this um, to the kitchen. So you'll be baking it for 10 minutes on the one side, flipping it, baking it for another 10 minutes at 350 on the other side, and then you have your burgers. So how do you stop it? Like, what do you, you serve it? it? What do you serve it? I mean, they're good even if you eat them alone. You could use them as a substitute for a hamburger. There, you can experiment and find what you like. Yes. When I've made burgers in the past, I've done it on the stove top. You can do it on the stove top too. Although, like, if you're trying to avoid frying, you'd want to bake them. But you can do them. You can fry them on the stove top too. And also one more maybe a tip for uh, if you don't want to get stuck to to the bottom of your baking uh, sheet or whatever, you can put, after you put oil, you can put a little bit of uh, flour and put on that and it will not get uh, a stick to the bottom. Just a little bit of flour. I haven't tried that, but yeah, you yeah. can Just try that at home. Yeah. So that, those are your burgers, um, and I'll show you the finished product. product, product. Oh, it's, um, well, this is actually what it looks like when it's done. Um, so, yeah. So that's what it should look like when it's done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, we're going to move on to our next recipe. We see we have a homemade beer chili, so my name is Ida. I'm Christina. Alright, so to get started, we're first going to um, saute or steam the first few vegetables. So we're just going to turn this on to like um, low, medium heat. And we're just going to pour about half a cup of water. First things we're going to start steaming are the green peppers, the onion, and garlic. And the celery. And we're going to let those go in there until they get a little bit soft. Another thing is like if you notice that when you're starting to cook it, like it starts to stick to the bottom, you can always add more water. And so we're just gonna let it for a few minutes, and um, also make sure like to um, you know it's ready when it starts to get pretty soft. So we're just gonna let that sit and cook for a bit. 
So this is this is kind of unique. So this is kind of like usually using oil. It's okay. We're just going to use water. As a health care alternative to this. One thing about this recipe is that it's super easy, but it will take a lot of time to cook everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, so most of preparation, when it comes to the, it's mostly just the cooking because everything is already, um, you guys see how like canned beans, canned corn, so most of the ingredients are already prepped. So it's a very, very convenient recipe. You get it for large quantities, so you can have it for days. So it's great for meal prepping as well. So what do you put first, the harder, the, the, the harder vegetables? Or the yes, so we first start off with the onion and garlic, mm -hmm. and the celery and the green bell peppers. Then we're going to saute it for a few minutes until it turns soft. Okay. And then we are we're going to add the rest of the ingredients. Okay, okay. Because these, these are not only the vegetables that need to be cooked. Since like everything else is canned, it's already kind of pre-cooked. So mm -hmm. once you um, saute the vegetables, it's very quick from then on. Um, do you do you have to use um, can can uh, beans? It's not necessary. Um, it's just usually it's more convenient because when it comes to cooking beans, it yeah. takes like usually like, uh, two or three hours. Like it takes a long time to cook it. Yeah. Also, on the corn, of course, you can absolutely use. Um, you can also you can cook the corn the beans yourself. It's just that it's more convenient to use canned. Okay. So if you're concerned, you can absolutely use your own beans. Another thing is, it's mentioned in the recipe to use pinto beans and uh, uh, and red kidney beans. We can also use whatever beans you want. It's very free to choose. Maybe just one time. Or also, it can be cooked in the slow cooker overnight. So when yeah. you get up in the morning, you get already. If you don't don't prefer uh, can. Can you do this dish in a crock pot? Leave it overnight? Maybe you can. I didn't try. Oh, yeah, sorry. I have like experiments. Okay. 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 So, how long it uh, takes for the whole approach to be done? I mean, for the whole meal to be done from starting to starting cooking, I mean. So I would say all together it's about 30 minutes. So the prep time will maybe take like 10 minutes. The cooking itself is 20 minutes. So yeah. Do you just have it like that? Do you just eat it like that or you can have it with other things? So, so you can um, you can have other things, like other vegetables. Yeah, yeah. Uh, eat it, I mean, just that alone by itself. Oh, you mean like for serving? Yeah, yeah, for serving. Yeah, for that alone. Oh, you can like do multiple things, right? Uh, this is sort of a Mexican style dish with lots of spices in it. Um, so you can always serve it with anything like green onions, sour cream, tortilla chips, and even just like as, on the side as like a soup to anything. Because I never had that before. <laughs> Yeah, of course, you can eat it by itself. You can add, like, um, I think if you look at, really get the recipe, you see that it has, like, the sour cream, tortilla chips, as Christina was mentioning. So, yeah, you can, it's very flexible, this dish. So, you can do whatever you want. We have some original Mexicans here, so they can tell us is it a Mexican recipe or it's not. <laughs> it's not something cooking. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> Things are probably starting to heat up now. The onion and the garlic always smells the best. Yeah. Oh yeah. Also, celery has a nice smell. Yeah. 
smell it, I can smell it. Mm. Just wait till like when we start adding other spices, it's gonna smell so good. So it, is it two different kind of beans you have here? So for this demonstration, I'm using red kidney beans and pinto beans. Oh, okay. As I mentioned earlier, you can use whatever beans you like. Yeah. A lot of these recipes that we're showing are very um, like changeable for like your own taste, whatever you like. To have. Um, if you like extra corn, you can always do that. Like everything's super. Or if you're not very good with spices, just have a little less. So I can, can adjust the wrong taste, right? Yeah. So the orange. Uh, is it like carrots or beans? Oh, you see this? No, the other side. Those are pinto beans. Oh, that's pinto beans. Okay, yeah. thank you. I'd like to say, Ina started the first time trying this recipe, and it was around 9 or 10 in the evening. And it started smelling, and I had to break my diet or whatever. I just had to try. It was so, so nice and tasty. All right, so it looks like it's finally starting to steam. So we're just going to uh, let it stir for a bit to make sure it doesn't stick. And um, if you notice it's starting to stick, you can always add more water. So if you put oil inside, what is, is not good, right? You know, it's good, but if uh, it starts uh, sticking to the bottom, yes. then you'll add a little bit more water. Yeah, so you don't want it to burn. You can just add more water to make it not Especially as sticky. Especially the reaction. That's yeah. Okay. Yes. You know, if you've had the lid on, it might cook faster even, right? The lid was on. Oh, maybe, yeah. It will cook faster, right? Yeah, I think it's just starting to steam, yeah. so maybe I'll just put the lid on for now, and then I'll just let it sit for a bit. Let yeah. it simmer. Yeah, simmer. Mike's right. You can just up maybe everything and then transfer there to cook. Yeah, of course. So I guess for the best version. If I wanted to take this uh, green chili up a few notches, you know, add more heat to it, like a traditional Mexican uh, meal, what would you suggest? Oh, so more, I think you should ask um, Albert. <laughs> 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 awesome. Yeah, traditional Mexican, so. All right. Maybe more chili powder. Maybe more chili, yeah. So yeah. traditional spices. I'm not too familiar with Mexican cuisine, or like yeah. generally, but um, I think you can definitely add more chili, um, paprika. paprika, yeah. yeah. Let's add some more spices. Okay. Okay, so for time's sake, we're just gonna like just add everything on. So normally, like you just kind of want to saute this until the vegetables are pretty soft. But we're just gonna go ahead and just add the rest of the ingredients. So now we're just going to add about. Uh, one 15 ounce uh, can or about uh, one, one and a half cups of the red kidney beans. And we're going to add the same quantity for the pinto beans. And next we have about one cup of canned corn. And now you're just really just going to add everything and start mixing it. And now we're going to add our spices. So we have a tablespoon of salt, one teaspoon of oregano, a tablespoon of cumin powder, and uh, four tablespoons of chili powder. So now we're just going to add that all here and mix it. Now you the see like you nice smell like really good spices. I'm just going to stir that all. And now we're going to add about two cups of crushed tomatoes. And 
now we're just going to stir it. So, so it's super simple at this point. You're just going to add all of your ingredients and just stir. And then we're just going to add about a cup of water. Oh. Again, it's very interchangeable with like what you would like. If you'd like it more thick or mm. more soupy, then mm. more or less water and um, cook it for less or more time. Yeah. So if you want it to be like more of like a like a, a stew texture, just want to let it going to cook it for more to be more thick. Or if you want to add, like, as Chrissy has mentioned, to be more like soup and more liquidy, just add more water. You don't have to cook for as much. And then that's pretty much it for this recipe because all you have to do now is just let it cook. So you're just going to turn up to actually to a high heat. You're just going to wait until it starts to boil, let the bubble a bit. And then once that happens, you're just going to cover it with the lid. You're just going to let it um, cook at medium low heat for about 10 minutes. And then you can let it, um, then after that, just take off the lid and let it cook for about five minutes. But again, this is all up to your personal preference. If you want to, like, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to have it, like, um, as a more stew, you just uh, let it cook for more so the liquid starts to evaporate. If you want a more, uh, like, liquidy soupy, you just don't have to cook it as much and just add more water. And, um, yeah, I think that's it. So does anyone else have any other questions? All right, thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. Take this thank you both so much for that demonstration. I'm sure we enjoyed both of those recipes that we got to try. And if you guys noticed in the package that was distributed, you have access to all of those recipes to recreate at home. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to get into the fun part of our workshop, which, not to say that the recipe is not fun, but this is the hands-on component where we are going to actually be preparing a quinoa salad recipe. So I'd invite you to get into groups of two or three. Um, those who registered online will have um, access to each of these tables and everyone else can maybe help out if there is a smaller group maybe we can join that way um, so I'll have you guys get into groups of two or three and then go to each of your stations for further instructions